Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Hong Kong Wine and Dine Festival 2020 Online Master Classes, Wine and Spirits Talks, organized by Hong Kong Tourism Board. When we talk about wine producing countries, many people would think of France, Italy, and Spain. But besides these three, the United States is the fourth largest wine producing country in the world. The wine production is undertaken in all 50 states, with California producing 81% of all U.S. wines. So aside from California, do you know what other quality wine regions are there on the West Coast? Originally from Sonoma, Master of Wine, Deborah Mikebird will take you on a tour to share about the Terra wine and food today. Let's welcome Deborah. Hello, Deborah. It's a great Hello. honor to have you here with us Thank today. Thank you, Elaine. I'm very happy to be here. Hello, everyone. And of course, we should say hello to our online friends as well. And a friendly reminder for those of you who have bought the tasting kit and to join the wine tasting later, have them ready now and um, join us for the next half an hour. And we might even throw up some questions for you so you could type up the answer and also your questions. And Deborah will try to answer them as many as possible. So today's theme is the Pacific West. So without further ado, let me pass the time to Deborah and introduce us the three wines from the Tasting Kids. Well, we're showing three wines today. The first wine will be from Oregon, a property called Lingua Franca from Bunker Hill in the Willamette Valley. And our second wine will be from beautiful Sonoma County from a winery called Flowers. And our final wine will be Grand Napa Cabernet from Napa Valley, California. So for those of you who haven't had the chance to purchase this tasting kits, you could do it now. There are $800 and you can go on the website masterclasses.discoverhongkong.com to purchase them. So do it now before they all gone. <laughs> so Deborah, let's talk about US wine today. I'm so excited about this class. And um, before we do that, how about we throw a questions for our friends online? Yes. So um, we want to know what's your impressions of US wine? Type up the answer, let us know, and we'll see if that's the same answer from Deborah. <laughs> so when we talk about U.S. wine, Deborah, we often think of California immediately. So where are the key regions? Well, California is by far the largest wine producing region in America, of course. It produces between 80 to 90 percent of the country's wines. But other notable regions are Washington and Oregon in the west, and surprisingly, New York in the east. I'm not talking about Manhattan, but upstate New York in the Finger Lakes, a region that specializes in Pinot Noir and Riesling. But there's also wine production in Virginia on the East Coast. Texas is booming and as well Pennsylvania. In fact, Elaine, there are wineries in all U.S. states except Hawaii. Well, I think they make pineapple wine. Right. And I think maybe would, would the latitudes make a difference for the wines? Absolutely, because all around the world, the key wine regions are positioned between 30 degrees and 50 degrees latitude. This is where the weather is largely temperate and kind to our precious vines. And it's the same in the States. So the West Coast is America's most important wine zone, running from California through Oregon and up to Washington, hundreds of kilometers of vineyard landscape. Right, and I see we have some friends answering our, our questions. Their impression is that um, U.S. wines are more uh, ripe and less acidic and alcoholic with fruity notes. Is that right, Deborah? Well, I, I would say that the wines from America tend to be fuller flavored, a little more lush and plush uh, with their fruit than perhaps the wines we're used to from France. But that's because the zones they're growing the grapes in are largely sunny and warm, so they produce very ripe fruit. And we're going to try some today. Yes. I'm so excited about it. So, and I always wonder why are the West Coast hosting most of the wineries, even though 
mm. almost 50, all 50 states are producing their own wines. But why, why is West Coast hosting yeah. most of the wines? Well, in particular, the West Coast has a very dry climate that's very favorable to grapes. Grapes do not like humidity. Otherwise, if they did, I'm sure all of Hong Kong's wine lovers would be planting vineyards here. So grape growers on America's East Coast really struggle with humidity. They have to battle some sneaky molds. And then, of course, there's some historic reasons why California wines are so substantial. They were initially planted by Catholic missionaries making their way up the California coastline. And then later, the excellent conditions in places like Napa and Sonoma attracted European families with grape growing history, especially the Italians, who considered the region very similar to the Tuscan Hills. And then in the meantime, gold was discovered in California. So then suddenly there were huge numbers of thirsty people who wanted wine to celebrate their luck of their finds of gold or kind of drown their sorrows. I think, Elaine, it's a bit like Macau. They want wine to celebrate the win and they need wine to celebrate the loss. Right, and also with the Pacific Coast, the temperature might mix with different too. Yeah, well, the Pacific Coast is very temperate, low humidity. The rain really only takes place in the winter, which is helpful for the vines. And then we have easygoing, gentle slopes, suitable soils, and all these contributed to make wine making a really attractive business. So excellent terroir for sure, but also it was important that the wine regions were close to large cities. Wine regions close to large cities always excel because they allow people to access the regions and experience firsthand what a real wine lifestyle can be. Coastal weather is also of particular importance as successful regions feature warm days, but cool nights. So the typical day to nighttime temperature change in Sonoma County it can easily drop 20 degrees Celsius once the sun goes down. And that's my question comes in is that if the regions are sharing similar conditions, does that mean they are sharing similar or are they producing similar mm. wine style? No, in fact, uh, it's a great question because the result is wines are very diverse. So generally speaking, um, summers are warmer in California and cooler in Oregon. Now Washington is surprisingly warm because most Washington wineries are positioned somewhat inland uh, near the deserts of bordering Idaho. So the warmer California regions are really suited for bolder, heavier grape varieties like Cabernet Sauvignon and Zinfandel and the cooler wine regions like Sonoma County, which is cooled by the ocean breezes, excel at what we call cool climate varieties, such as Pinot Noir. Now, Pinot Noir is also outstanding in Oregon as well as Chardonnay. So Oregon is cooler than California due to its northern location, um, but it also benefits from these ocean breezes. Whereas Washington's wineries are further away from the ocean and therefore warmer, so they produce bolder, heavier wines, usually made from Cabernet Sauvignon or Merlot or fabulous Syrah. So with that in mind, we have an Oregon wine today. How about we get into our first tasting, yes, Debra? Yes, indeed. So here today we have a lovely Lingua Franca Estate Chardonnay, vintage 2017 from Bunker Hill in the Willamette Valley. Now the Willamette Valley is often regarded as the Burgundy of the states, particularly because their weather is similar, their geology is similar to Burgundy, and so they're, suitab they're suitable for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. In fact, many Burgundian producers have established wineries in the Willamette Valley or joint ventures. So this winery is a good example. Lingua Franca's history began with master sommelier Larry Stone, who formed a partnership with Dominique Lafont from Burgundy. So as you'd expect, the winery specializes in Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. 
So to taste this wine, uh, let's begin by examining the intensity of the fruit. So that's the power and the strength of the aroma. So I suggest you hold your glass here and bring it slowly towards your nose. And when you can smell the wine, stop moving the glass and ask yourself, do I smell this wine from here, here, or here? So if you smell the wine below your nose, it's high intensity, powerful aromas. You say things like perfumed fruit. If it's between your nose and your chin, you will make a comment like, mmm, elegant, delicate, uh, subtle. And if you have to put your nose in the glass in order to smell the wine, then you say something like, Mmm, interesting. Right, and I smell creamy, creamy type of smell in. Absolutely. In my nose so right what now. you're detecting, Elaine, is the spices and vanilla from which tell us the wine was aged in oak, uh, oak barrels, and indeed it was for about 11 months. And then also, when you taste a wine like this, there's a weight, a thickness a little bit like whole milk that tells you that the wine not only rested in oak, but it also rested in the oak with the yeast. And the yeast we call lees right. as, it, as it passes through its lifespan. And the lees help contribute to a thickness, a roundness of the wine. So we call that weight. So we would say this is a full-bodied Chardonnay. So our friends from, um, from online, do you have the same Aroma? Do you smell the same thing? And do you like the wine? Let us know. Type up your any questions or your comments about this wine and let us know. Please do. Yes, let me try one more sip. The other thing to watch for with the Chardonnay is the acidity, the freshness, the crispness that you would feel on the sides of your tongue. And I think the biggest mistake people make with wine is they choose a wine super flavorful, but not enough acidity. And the result is they can only drink a few sips before they get tired. So if you're finding wine for a wedding and you want your guests to drink like crazy, look for the wines with higher acidity. And this is quite balanced to me and I love it. Mm. So speaking of um, Pinot Noir you mentioned earlier, and we do mm. have one coming from Sonoma, which is the second wine in the tasting kits. But before we go into that, we of course have to ask you about Sonoma, Deborah, because. <laughs> You're the perfect person to tell us because <laughs> you were born in Sonoma, right? I was. I, I have lived in Hong Kong, uh, 32 years, but I did grow up in Sonoma County and my family is still there and we do have a few vines, not a large vineyard, but a small vineyard there. So I grew up surrounded by beautiful vineyards and Sonoma County is about one hour's drive north of San Francisco and is beloved by its fans. The county is shaped by a range of low mountains along our coastline and another range of mountains that divide Sonoma from Napa on the east side. In between, their rolling mountains carve up the landscape. So Sonoma County offers many microclimates and therefore very diverse styles of wine. In fact, there are over 400 wineries in Sonoma County. And I want to say, Elaine, something I'm particularly proud of is that Sonoma County wineries are very environmentally conscious and agree to commit to the region's future by protecting their growing environments. So Sonoma County was the first region in the world to set a goal to have 100% sustainability in their wineries. And already 99% of the wineries have achieved this certification. So this ensures our wildlife, which includes our crazy wild turkeys, and our workforce and landscapes are safe for future generations. The landscapes in Sonoma County, I, they take my breath away every time I go visit my family. Sonoma County landscapes are dramatic and they vary a lot from place to place. The county has beautiful ancient redwood groves, soft Tuscan hillsides, super steep, craggy hiking areas, and then of course our stunning Pacific Ocean shoreline. I, I try to be objective, but really this is a wonderful place. Um, Sonoma County, in terms of wine, Sonoma County is famed for its production of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, which are the two key varieties also of Burgundy in France. 
but the county is also admired for its elegant production of Zinfandel, which although originally from Europe is considered California's own variety. Sonoma County has 15 different ABAs. Those are American viticultural areas, 15 different certified districts. Uh, one of them, the Dry Creek Valley, is near my parents' home, and it's famed for its high-quality Zinfandel, uh, whereas the coastal regions like Green Valley or Russian River Valley, where we, mar my parents are in the heart of the Russian River Valley, uh, these are celebrated for growing cool climate varieties like Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. And then further south in the county, um, you see wind streaming from the south, from San Francisco Bay, which is always windy. And that means this area in the southern Sonoma County is well suited for Pinot Noir, as well as a few sheep. <laughs> right, you, you, you've mentioned about that Sonoma is being um, near the coast. So are there any natural conditions that would impact mm -hmm. um, this, all these wines? In fact, Sonoma County and nearby Napa County really should be too hot to grow grapes. And if it weren't for our special uh, fogs, there would be no wine industry in these counties. And the good news is nature likes to equalize temperatures. We see this here in Hong Kong on the peak. We've all experienced those fogs that occur on the peak. Uh, when cool temperatures from northern China come into our hills and collide with the hot temperatures coming up from the South China Sea. The result is fog. So it's the same. In Sonoma County, each day the cold Pacific Ocean weather enters the county from the west via some openings provided by the Russian River Valley and then it also comes up to the county from the south via an opening from the San Francisco Bay. So in Sonoma County, our afternoons are warm and sunny, but by nightfall, these fogs come rushing in and remain, as you can see, until mid-morning. And you can't imagine how many times growing up, I would depart my house in high temperatures, wearing a sundress, only to return home after dinner with my <laughs> teeth chattering. Um, but the fogs change everything, and it's the fogs that allow Sonoma County to excel with Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. And in fact, Sonoma County fogs are exactly why Flowers Wine reproduces such gorgeous Pinot Noir. And, and to be honest, Sonoma is so beautiful that I want to fly over right now, but before we could do that, <laughs> we could taste the wine from Sonoma. And how about we throw a question for our friends online too. Um, do you guys know what are the top three largest producing countries of Pinot Noir? Ah, Elaine, you're testing me as well then. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what they think. Type up your answers, let us know, and we'll see if you got it correctly, okay? Great. So let's try this, right? Yes, yeah, so the area where Flowers is located is very interesting. The vineyards are on land that was once a trading ground between the local Pomo Indians and for uh, Russian fur traders. So the owners of the winery are Joan and Walter Flowers, and yes, that really is their name. I remember when they arrived in Sonoma County, they, they arrived from Pennsylvania, and for me, it just seemed so eccentric that they would plant so close to the Pacific Ocean where all the cool mists are. Uh, we thought, huh, how are they gonna get their grapes ripe? But they were right, and the world has loved their Pinot Noir since their first vintage. Uh, Chantal Fortin there is director of winemaking. She used to work with Oak Ridge and Bonnie Dune. And together with the Flowers family have really ensured these wines are made with minimal interventions. And then these extreme coastal conditions always result in a layered Pinot Noir with a really bright fruit focus. I was actually attracted by the name Flowers. And what should we expect to smell? Well, I think when it comes wine. to uh, the red wine world, I can give you some bluffing tips. 
Okay, so I like to tip a red wine glass over my watch or wiggle my fingers under a glass to see if I can see through the wine. And if I can see through the wine, which this one, I hope those of you that have the wine can see your fingers wiggling. And that tells you it's a medium or light bodied red wine. And if you know you've got a red, light bodied red wine, then here's my bluffing trick. You can describe the wine as though it were made from red skinned fruits. And there's only a few of them, raspberry, strawberry, cherry. So just bring the glass to your nose and say, ah, oh, amazing raspberry, strawberry, cherry. And then if you want to take it a step further, you might say, hmm, but what cherries? Is that, hmm, Bing cherry? Or is that cherry from Shandong province? Maybe only your nose could smell so specific. I smell cherries though, I did but smell But a bit cherries. of fun. And then also a wine with the, its lighter style, you can see through it. It's helpful to describe the, the palette and the texture in feminine terms. So we can take a sip of this wine and describe it with words like silky, elegant, delightful, pretty, beautiful. Even you could say sexy wine. It, it's really elegant to be. I really like it. It's very easy drinking and I think ladies would love it just by the name like me and then when you <laughs> taste it, you just fall in love with it. Well, I see that some of our friends are answering our questions. What are the top three largest producing countries of Pinot Noir? Um, some of them said France, New Zealand, Argentina, are they Austria, right? Austria right. even. Wow, interesting guesses and Canada is also a very fine guess. But France is number one, of course. Yay. France is the ancestral home of Pinot Noir in Burgundy. And then the US is number two. And surprisingly, number three might not be what you expect. I secretly would have guessed New Zealand, which produces some of the world's finest Pinot Noir. But in fact, it's Germany. And in Germany, it's so cool. They struggle to make rich, ripe, red, robust wines. So Pinot Noir excels in their cool climate. Right, so thank Great you for all answers. your answers. So after we taste the second one from Sonoma, we probably should move to our neighbor, mm -hmm. Napa Valley, right? And um, we, uh, we know that it's right next to Sonoma. And uh, tell us why are we tasting the wine from Napa Valley at last? Is there well, a reason? Napa Valley is, of course, America's most celebrated and famous wine region. It's located right next to Sonoma, but inland, just over the Mayacama Mountains. Uh, and when I was young, my school would play sports to compete with Napa schools. And in fact, our two counties always have been friendly rivals. Um, because Napa is further inland, it's temperatures are warmer than Sonoma County, so it's better suited for grape varieties that can handle more heat like Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot. These are the same famed varieties of Bordeaux, which is why Bordeaux lovers are often huge fans of Napa Valley wines. And the Napa Valley is extraordinarily beautiful, especially if you're looking across the main valley from the hills. And each year the region receives millions of visitors eager to experience the wine country lifestyle. But in fact, Napa Valley is quite small it's no, located between the Maya Kama Mountains and the Vaca Range, and it is just about eight kilometers across at its widest point, and at its longest, 50 kilometers. It's roughly the length of Hong Kong Island. Um, the first Napa vineyards were planted on what we call the Napa floor, the flat valley running north to south in Napa Valley. So some of the most famous and earliest California wineries, such as Mondavi, were first established on the floor. And then celebrated AVAs, or wine districts, uh, on the Napa Valley floor would include St. Helena, Oakville, Rutherford, Yachtville, Oak Knoll. And then hillside AVAs, or districts, would include Howl Mountain and Stag's Leap, which grow riper fruit because they catch the afternoon sun or Spring Mountain and Mount Veeder on this side who have to plant high on the hills to catch the morning sun coming in above the foggy conditions. 
Napa first captured world attention in the 70s, 1976, at the Judgment of Paris. This was an occasion about which two movies have already been made. I hope you've seen them. So in total, Napa Valley is home to 16 AVAs, or Official American Viticultural Areas. But don't think Napa Valley is red wine only. Napa produces very smart Chardonnay and some of the most revered Sauvignon Blanc, and might I say some of the most expensive Sauvignon Blanc in the world. And one thing I admire about Napa is, is the community spirit and the growers' commitment to the environment and to the people working with them. Napa was the first region in America to focus on premium wines, and every year they host a fabulous premium Napa Valley auction in February. Great, and before we try the wine from the Napa Valley, how about I throw out one question for our online friends because we tried Chandelier earlier. And I want to know, what do you think, or why do you think Chandelier is the world's favorite white wine? Everyone loves Chardonnay. Right. Why? Yes, type up the answer Tell and let us, us know. <laughs> and in the meantime, we'll now taste a wine from the heart of Napa Valley floor, uh, from a winery called Grand Napa, Grand Napa. And this is a Cabernet Sauvignon 2015. And this is from the Rutherford District near the Maya Kama Range. This is really in the heart of Napa Valley. And Cabernets from this particular property even won gold medals as far back as 1889 in Paris at the World's Fair. This is a historic performer of high quality wine. I see. And let's try to taste yes. it. Yes. So first we're going to smell the Cabernet aromas. Last time I told you uh, the light-bodied wines smell like red fruit, but when it comes to these full-body wines, the wines you cannot see through, then start reflecting on dark purple skin fruit such as blackberry, black cherry, black raspberry, even blueberry or plum. Wow, it's quite Delicious. powerful. Very concentrated yes. and complex and layered. And when it comes to Cabernet particularly, it's always important to think about the tannins, which is the tannins come from skins and it's the, we know it very well because tannins are in tea, but it's the texture that makes your tongue a little rough and bumpy. So if you're not sure how to describe tannins, I always think about fabric. So I think tough tannins are like wool, well, and soft tannins lining. are like leather, suede, velvet, lace, or silk. So while we're enjoying the wine, and of course, thank you, Deborah, for all those insightful informations. How about we we'll get to some questions from yes. our online friends? I know uh, they have a lot of questions, actually. And from the previous question, they actually throw out some, some of the great answer, like very fruity, um, fruit flavors of apple, pear. And I want Deborah to answer some of the well, questions from our friends online. Well, I'm seeing your answers and, and hearing what you're saying, right. these apple, pear, tropical, melon, and that's all the reasons why people love Chardonnay. What's interesting about it is it's a winemaker's wine. Winemakers can do almost anything they like with this variety, making it fresh, vibrant, crisp, or soft, silky, fat, and buttery. Well, we don't have time for all the questions, but I think one interesting question that we should ask Deborah is, how do you become a master of, <laughs> master of wine like yourself? I think a lot of people would like to know. Well, Master of Wine is a title. It's not a uh, university degree. It's an actual title that you try to get. Uh, it took me uh, about six years, which is pretty much average. And it took me uh, a good six years to learn how to spit. So it's a four day exam and you taste 12 wines each morning blind and you write about a page and a half on each wine. And then um, you write essays in the afternoon and providing you pass that four day exam, write a dissertation. So I think the big gift uh, studying for a master of wine title gives you is a global understanding of grapes, vines, the wine industry, world markets, science, history, and art, everything I love about wine. And we're so lucky to have you here with us today to tell us so much more about wines. <laughs> okay, let's get to one more question from our friends online. They would like to know, how do you suggest to pair with wines? Like what food, like food pairing? Woo! 
That's a big question. <laughs> um, so the traditional rule is red, red wine, red meat, white wine, white meat. Um, and we, but we can always break the rules. I often think about acidity, how sour is the wine. If the wine is quite acidic, I feel a lot of sourness here, then I imagine it's like a lemon, and any food that would go with lemon juice will match with that wine. But I think in Asia, we have a particular challenge because we don't cook uh, beef solo or uh, lamb solo, or we often have things heavily sauced or seasoned. So my particular fun is to consider the sauce. Is the sauce salty? Is the sauce flavorsome? Is it sweet? And then pair it against the wines. Thank you, Deborah, for all this information. It was a great sharing. So with all this information, if any of you haven't had the chance to buy the three wines from the tasting kit, remember to visit our website masterclasses.discoverhongkong.com purchase them while the stock lasts <laughs> and of course we want this to continue but our time is about to come to an end so thank you once again Deborah, for your wonderful sharing and I think a toast is the perfect things to do at the end of this Absolutely. class Absolutely. and say cheers to our friends to online everyone. as well thank hope you, you enjoyed the wine us. right and to you yes cheers thank you Deborah. <laughs> And later on today at 4.45, another speaker, Adam Wong, the executive chef of four restaurants, will join the masterclass with us. And the theme is a yet fried rice. So for those of you who have bought the kit, have the cook-along kit ready and we'll see you then. Stay tuned. Once again, thank you, Deborah. Hope everyone has a wonderful time. So see you at the next class. Thank you. Bye. Bye, -bye.酒佳肴巡礼，网上大师班，美酒佳话将会率先呈现星级登场同非凡名厨，非凡绝配。世界级酒评家 James Suckling 将会同大家品味波尔多新风，葡萄酒大师 Debra 带嚟美国西部庄园佳肴。點解意大利釀造嘅酒會有香港風情？酒評人 Ronnie 會話俾大家知。三屆香港品酒師比賽冠軍 Eric Kwok 會傳授開 party 嘅美酒佳肴絕配。Ivan Sir 將會撮合日本清酒同東南亞美食，呢次邂逅絕對令你回味無窮。识饮都要识酒品同识配搭，品酒师 Damon 唔识教到你识。Stephen Sir 带路去西班牙必去酒庄，同教你调制 Sangria 水果酒。大家仲可以同呢班大师即场品酒，即时互动。一个网睇晒直播同点播，完全免费。Cheers.